Welcome everybody, if you're still um, joining us. Um, thank you so much for joining our departmental colloquium today. Our speaker is Dr. Louise Seamster from the University of Iowa, and she is our 2020 Shaw speaker. This is kind of a special slot in our colloquium series. Our department chair, Dr. Jim Elsner, holds the Earl B. and Sophia H. Shaw chair and has designated funds for um, for the colloquium director, so that's me this this term, uh, to invite uh, typically a junior scholar um, who they feel is at the very cutting edge of their own specialty areas of research, who whose work um, we are personally extremely excited about. Um, so some of our recent past colloquium directors have invited speakers to the Shaw series that include Dr. Mary Ellen Hicks, a historian and Black Studies scholar at Amherst. Dr. Michael Widener, a health and transportation geographer at Toronto, and Dr. Tiffany Lethabo King last year, um, who is an interdisciplinary feminist and Black Studies scholar at Georgia State. And Dr. Louise Seamster is this year's uh, Shaw speaker. So before I tell you a little bit uh, more about Dr. Seamster, I just wanted to let people know that during the Q&A, if you want to ask your direction or your question directly to Dr. Seamster, um, use the like raise hand function and, and we can let you do it that way. Um, or if you prefer, you can use the Q&A down at the bottom of your um, screen, you'll see there is an option, um, which is it's just easier to manage the questions that way instead of using the chat. But I'll try to keep an eye on both, but we'll primarily be using the, the Q&A function. Um, so our department, just also FYI, has a tradition of letting our grad students ask the first round of questions. So since we might have visitors um, with us today, I extend that invitation to all grad students in the audience. Um, please feel free to ask your questions first, and then we'll extend and open it up to everybody else. Uh, so Dr. Louise Seamster is a sociologist whose research examines contemporary mechanisms for the reproduction of racial and economic inequality. She is an assistant professor in sociology and criminology and African American studies at the University of Iowa. She earned her MA and PhD in sociology at Duke University, an MA in liberal studies at the New School for Social Research, and a BA at Vassar. Dr. Seamster's research centers on the interactive financial and symbolic factors reproducing racial inequality across multiple domains, particularly in cities. She writes about racial politics and urban development, emergency financial management, debt, and the myth of racial progress. Her current book project investigates the financial and political causes of the Flint water crisis. Another line of research examines racial disparities in debt. Her work on predatory inclusion in student debt has led to extensive policy advocacy, including research informing Senator Elizabeth Warren's student debt forgiveness plan. Her work has been published in Contexts, Sociological Theory, Du Bois Review, Social Currents, Environment Planning A, Ethnic and Racial Studies, and among other academic outlets, and she has guest edited five special issues on issues around race. I'm a super big fan of all the lines of Dr. Seamster's research, and I'm so pleased she's here today to speak with us about her work on the pressing issue of student debt. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Seamster. Thanks so much, Dr. Ponder. Um, I really appreciate getting to meet you over Zoom at <laughs> the next level okay. in, um, <laughs> after, after corresponding and sharing work for a couple of years now. So yeah. um, I'm excited to be here. I wish I was there physically, but We've all given up on that by now, so thanks. <laughs> um, uh, and um, uh, the, the intro talked a lot about Flint as much as student debt, um, but I'm happy to try and talk about some of the connections I see between these two projects in the Q&A, um, if, if people cool. are interested. Um, so today I should share my screen, it's one thing. Um, all right, is that working? So today uh, I'm doing an overview of the problem of student debt and how it relates to the racial wealth gap and racial inequality more broadly. And a lot of my research agenda kind of started from trying to explain the continuity of racial inequality after the end of legalized discrimination. And um, I'm kind of preoccupied with understanding how contemporary dynamics can um, 
amplify or create new forms of inequality that pick up on older processes so that we're not just seeing like the tail end dying out of the light but that this is that there are still active forms um, and financial processes going on that we need to take account of and I kind of fell into studying debt backwards, but um, when I retroactively explain why I think this is a really interesting topic to look at when I look at racial inequality, it's um, it ties to, it's you know as somebody who's interested in processes, it ties together things. So it ties together your past and your future. It's both shaped by and shaping your past and your future. It is tying together symbolic and the material realms. So we have both like narratives of debt and then also like the material structure of debt. And um, since people have increasing amounts of it, this is, a, this is something that's actively going on. This is not just, oh, we inherited this system and now it's going on from here, but that like these, these modern um, financial mechanisms are actively looking for new people um, to uh, <laughs> take in as borrowers. Um, and so I am thinking about um, how student debt in particular can help us kind of connect a bunch of different domains of, of how inequality is working in your life. That this is not just a, a higher ed story, but it's like kind of a node in a larger ecosystem. Um, and uh, saying again that we're, when we're looking at the racial wealth gap, this is not just a historical remnant, but something that's actively increasing today. And then thinking about how student debt fits in relation to this racial wealth gap. Is it is it helping as we've kind of been told, um, you know, this is our best weapon to fight <laughs> racial wealth inequality or or is it actually um, making things worse? Um, I wanted to start by just showing the size and the scope of the racial wealth gap because um, when this kind of was first established as a field by um, Melvin Oliver and Tom Shapiro in their book, Black Wealth, White Wealth, um, it was not really, these types of charts are not ones that we look at that often in society and my students are always shocked by the magnitude, but I, I, think, I think even 30 years into this field existing, it's not necessarily well known that we're talking about um, a difference that is still this large. So this is comparing the median family wealth um, for black and white families over time since 1963. And you can see that it started pretty large, um, but <laughs> has grown over time. And um, uh, so by in the nineties, when Oliver and Shapiro wrote their book, they found um, that for every dollar of wealth black families held, white families held $10. And then this has um, kind of uh, drastically increased over the recession and black families have still not recuperated what they lost over the recession. And when we look at this racial wealth gap, this is a financial manifestation of our country's founding in slavery where not only could most Black Americans not hold wealth for hundreds of years, but they themselves, for the most part, represented wealth and assets for white Americans. And that was before things like the Homestead Act of 1862, before the federal government's invention of the low-cost mortgage in the 1930s as a wealth building tool to create a large white middle class, and the use of redlining to make Black home acquisition difficult and to devalue homes in Black neighborhoods in order to value homes in white neighborhoods. I'm just mentioning a couple of the major government policies that have amplified and created this um, wealth inequality. And one, one reason why I started thinking about this a lot over when the data started coming out over the recession was that to me, showing these large changes really um, put the lie to any story about this just being a slow, cumulative or incremental or historical effect that if you could show these sharp changes in wealth overall, and not just due to the loss of homes in the foreclosure crisis, but that there were, there were deeper shifts going on, and that these numbers could change quickly. Um, I thought that really helped um, kind of definitively 
show that this is not just a matter of like different savings habits or different, you know, different cultural practices um, and, uh, you know, valuing the, the pennies, um, but, but that this was about something bigger going on about people's position in a, in a structural system. And we, we tend to talk about gaps and that language can make it sound like this a gap is you know slowly closing, we hope. Um, but uh, but in the as Dr. King pointed out, it, time itself is neutral. So we don't have any reason why this gap will close now that we have decided that racism is not a good thing. Um, and and in the, the case of compounding inequality and the absence of, of change. Um, diverging fortunes are going to keep compounding away from each other. So if anything, you know, we would expect this gap to, to expand, not contract. Um, and it's also important just to note that, so that was the median wealth gap. So that's comparing, you know, the, the person, the, the white family at the, the middle of the distribution and the black family at the middle of the distribution. But looking at the average racial wealth gap, the ratio is smaller, but the numeric gap is much larger. So the top here for, for whites is um, at almost a million dollars um, compared to black families holding on average $140,000 roughly in 2016. And so, um, and that's relevant because if you're looking at like inequality overall, um, you, you wanna know like what the distribution is. And so you need to look at both the average and the median and you start to see the true magnitude of wealth inequality here where we're talking about a difference of almost $800,000 between the average white and black family. And we've not really grappled as a nation with the, with the scope and the implications of these statistics. Um, and instead there's kind of been this whole parallel conversation for decades now where the primary message about economic mobility is you go to college. Um, uh, and, and then there's this implicit or explicit sometimes assumption that we should just wait for that inequality to even out over time and encourage more black students in particular to attend college. But my question is what if that is not working? And so I'm showing a lot of data today to kind of um, push on that big assumption that we all have as educators, you know, tend to have as educators that um, what we are doing is, is an equalizing force. So it's still true that attending college means you are more likely to earn more over a lifetime than if you do not attend college at all, but that masks some severe differences in outcomes. The racial wealth gap that we just observed is not an artifact of differences in education. In fact, this recent report that was comparing black and white wealth by education, so it shows black households here in the, the black bars, which don't even show up on the leftmost side here. Um, okay, if you're comparing black households whose head has a college degree, so that's the fourth column, you know, fourth set down, they still hold only two thirds of the wealth of white households whose head did not finish high school. And um, this is a report by um, among other authors, Derek Hamilton and Sandy Darity, who are um, I think the other great pair of scholars on racial wealth inequality. And they have pointed out that both home ownership and education are better wealth indicators than wealth creators. That is, we've got the causal order inverted in assuming that you should buy a house or go to college in order to generate wealth. And instead we should see a college attendance and home ownership as indicators of wealth. Um, we, from, from this graph and other, other extensive evidence, you can see that black families have a much lower return to wealth, to a lower return on education for wealth building. And a lot of the total, um, you know, when we're thinking about how wealth is created from student debt. This is not just about shaping your ability to build wealth otherwise, but the fact that student debt could be extensive enough to lower your wealth overall. So let me now move to showing how much debt there is overall, um, because I wanted to know what role is student debt playing in potential wealth building for black families? 
So student debt, you probably know there's a new article every month or so, and the number has always changed because this is just ticking up really quickly. Um, we're at about $1.7 trillion of student debt. And this is not, you know, we've gotten kind of used to that being a very large number, but it's not been like that for, for very long. This is a, a recent change. Like this is just looking, this graph is only looking at the change since 2007. And there's been a 160% increase in student debt overall. And you can see by comparing to these other forms of consumer debt that this is kind of anomalous. It's not like on par with other forms of debt um, over the course of the recession and then after the, the recovery. And we've kind of, like I said, gotten used to this being how things are. Like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. We know public college used to cost a few hundred dollars a semester. You could get a job scooping ice cream in the summers and pay for your tuition. And, um, but, but, <laughs> But we, I'm kind of going back to that and saying, we need to grapple with what happened in that shift, why, why you cannot any longer pay for um, college with, with a uh, ice cream scooping job. Um, and the, the story has been, as I've said, that you know, this is just coming from students enrolling, more students enrolling in college, so this is a good thing, we shouldn't worry about the debt, or alternately people say, you're still gonna get a higher return um, on your education from having attended. Um, sometimes people say that we shouldn't worry about this problem because students can't, um, uh, they can't, it's just because it's not a bubble because it can't pop. And so they're saying, well, students are stuck paying it no matter what, so we should be fine with it. Um, I, I don't find that to be a convincing argument, but uh, people have been making it. Um, but what, what I've been, thinking about is this has been like our big pitch for social mobility, like all the chips were on this one square of go to college. And then meanwhile, all these other social programs and, you know, redistributive policies, um, were getting eroded away from our social safety net. Um, we haven't seen a rise in the minimum wage in a while as uh, people are noticing recently. And so we've kind of got this perfect storm formed around how we are paying for um, higher ed. And to me, what makes this make more sense is looking at the racial disparities in recent trends in who is holding student debt. So I skipped ahead because um, Raf and I, I lost the, um, the paper name. Um, I have it later on. Um, this is an update, gra updated graph from a uh, chart from a chart we originally made in our 2017 paper on predatory inclusion. And at the time we only had data from the survey of consumer finances from 2001 to 2013. So that would be showing like the first five time points on this graph. And we were seeing that um, education debt was rising steeply unlike every other form of debt, but we were also seeing that it was rising much more steeply for um, for black households than for white households. So that's that red line in the middle is black households and then white households um, uh, in blue. And so we published expressing grave concern about what was happening with black student debt in particular and the basically the steepness of this line here. Um, but we only in the past couple of months got the updated 2019 data to see what had been happening since and, and mapped it out. And that was how we got this uh, chart, which is just like even more astronomically, like basically vertically increasing. Um, so I'm going to spend a while trying to explain to you why um, we think that's happening. Um, this is showing a, a, a fourfold increase in Black student debt over just 20 years. That is major. And at the same time, this is um, bringing in more and more black households into it. So about one in three black households now hold student debt. So this is not just a, a case of a few people have a whole lot of debt. This is a whole lot of people have a whole lot of debt. And this is the median level. So the median black household now holds $30,000 in student debt. And that this is now about almost $10,000 more than the um, median white borrowing household. And, and you can see that the dynamics are different here for Latinx households. So I'm not 
we are still wor working on explaining some of these different trends um, for Latinx families. And so we're going, I'm gonna be focusing on the black white racial wealth gap here today. And overall, our explanation for the spike that we saw in black student debt was that this, we had this shifting terrain around education um, that it created what we call uh, predatory inclusion. And we define this as the process by which previously excluded groups gain inclusion to any one institution, market, or benefit, but under terms that negate the benefit of inclusion. Um, so uh, in, in developing this framework, we were looking at the ways that that graph that I just showed you in student debt resembled the rise in subprime mortgages among black and brown households just prior to the Great Recession. But thinking about, okay, if that was a predatory form of inclusion into um, mortgage debt, then, then why were we seeing similar things with black student debt, like just following the Great the, the Recession? And, you know, it's really coming in, in some ways from effects from, stemming from the Great Recession. And so I want to explain some of the, these like larger contexts. So I'll keep trying, I'll keep moving through different graphs and explaining them. But I also wanted to um, mention that this eventually led to my formulation of um, thinking about good and bad debt, having different roles in your life, depending on who you are and what form of debt you are taking on. And so this is a piece I wrote in 2019 Black debt, white debt. So it's taking on the um, Oliver and Shapiro book title intentionally um, to think about how you could characterize um, debt as black debt and white debt, both as forms of debt that either black or white people might be more likely to have, but also debt that carries either positive or negative connotations morally and also has um, tends to produce either positive or negative outcomes in your life. And um, I have been arguing that um, the, we, you, you can be referring it in white debt or black debt to either different forms of debt. So a payday loan versus um, uh, access to like an American Express card, you could be having different terms on the same debt product. So that would be like your interest rate is set differently, or you could have the same debt in the same terms, but still have different outcomes because of your social position. Um, to, to holding the same amount of debt. And I, I wanna get at how debt, how that could happen, how debt can work differently for people um, because I think that this helps show how the racial wealth gap does not just matter for um, showing inequality but it actually underlies the effect of debt on your life. So when we're looking at that major difference, the increasing disparity in black and white student debt, we should also be thinking about those, the previous graphs showing um, much greater white wealth underlying um, these debt numbers. So I made a beautiful diagram showing that if you have family wealth, you may go to college without debt at all. Great. Um, you will be able to start building wealth out of the box as soon as you graduate. You may also hold family wealth and take on debt um, when you go to college. Um, but if you do, it's still going to, the, that wealth is going to be, make it much easier to repay your debt in lots of ways. So you're going to have a relatively easy repayment trajectory. Um, you can still have the way, the path smoothed for you in lots of ways. It could be your parents are going to still fund you for the first two years so you can take that low paid internship and get the really good job. Um, or so they might give you a down payment so that you don't have to be paying rent um, while you are paying off your student loan. So you could really focus on paying your student loan and get it done in a few years and then, and then move on to wealth creation. So in these cases, that, that assumption that, um, even with debt, college can be leveraged into greater wealth creation um, may hold true that you can still move through this pathway in this, in, in this model. There's a lot of other ways that wealth can work to help like 
subsidize your college experience, even if you have debt. And if you want to talk about them, uh, we, we can later on. But if you um, don't have that family wealth, it's gonna be a lot harder to repay the debt. And so um, because black families are much less likely to hold intergenerational wealth, the great majority are, are attending college in this bottom condition. So having low to no family wealth and then attending college financed by debt. And, and just to name a couple of the ways that this is gonna play out in terms of drawing this difference and how long it takes to even repay your debt at all. Um, so you might have taken on more debt because you were working full time. And so it took you more years to complete your education. Um, I, as an instructor, I'm quite familiar with students having to take course overloads and then failing and having to drop out and then recover and then they lost their scholarship. Like I'm sure these, these kind of familiar stories to you. Um, also after college, they are more likely to have to take any old job that they can get because they have to start repaying the debt within six months or they can go to graduate school. And I can see how in that case, it might be easier to just say, I'm going to go to graduate school and because I cannot, I do not yet have the, the earning potential to repay the debt I already have. So you're kind of trapped in um, by, by the debt you have. Also importantly, um, uh, Black and Latinx young people are much more likely to be sending money up generations to their own parents to be supporting them, especially as the person who went to college, they're expected to be the financially stable one and, and hold down often multiple family members. Um, whereas uh, for, for white younger people, they are much more likely to still be subsidized by their parents through disinherited wealth in many ways. It could be just your phone's paid for, but it can be a lot more expensive than that. But all these factors are gonna work together such that for um, black and Latinx young uh, bar student borrowers, their debt is going to stick around a lot longer. I didn't even talk about the fact that they're suffering from racial wage discrimination. And so it's going to take longer to earn enough to pay off this debt. Um, but but this is, um, you know, this is one way in which you're, you, you can start at the same place, you can attend college, you can even attend college with debt and you can, your, your fortunes can still um, go very differently. And, and when I, you know, ultimately I'm, at this point I'm thinking that education is not the great equalizer and I'm willing to kind of take a stand on that. And I'm thinking instead higher education is more like the Olympics and wealth is the equivalent of the performance enhancing drugs that make the impossible look possible. And when we think about like what sociologists call the life course of student debt, so how, how it plays through different stages of your life, that's where we, we really start to see these compounding effects working across domains. Um, and so thinking about these diverging trajectories over time, um, you, can, you can start to extrapolate. And we've, we've also started to see this translate into um, studies that have been tracking like older cohorts of students and what their diverging pathways look like in reality. So not just my model of like how I think it could happen, but, but um, what this, this disparity in repayment ability looks like. So um, Judith Scott Clayton and Lee in 2018 were updating a study that they'd done um, two years earlier. So first they looked at four years out after graduation and they found that four years after graduation, just looking at black and white graduates, so the best case scenario, people who actually had a college degree, um, the, the gap in student debt load had tripled. So black students now owed more than when they began and white students had start, started to pay off their debt in general. And then they looked at 12 years after graduation and that gap had quadrupled. So now the gap was, I, I messed up this middle diagram. The, it's not, it wasn't 10,000 to 10,000. There was a middle number that was about 30,000, apologize. Um, so it went from about, about $10,000 gap to $30,000 gap. And then 12 years after graduation that had risen again to a $43,000 gap between black and white graduates. And I was already pretty disturbed by that, but then um, in 
2019, this report um, by my co-authors, um, Laura Sullivan and Tom Shapiro found it, um, it was doing the same thing, but tracking for longer. So 20 years after starting college, they found that the typical, so the median black borrower still owed 95% of the debt that they had started with when leaving school and the typical white student owed only 6%. So we basically saw no change in the balance of the median black borrower and we saw um, the median white borrower was almost done paying off their loans. Um, and you know, if that wasn't a stressful enough looking graph, I wanna point out that this is for people who started in 1996. So that was before the huge explosion in um, tuition uh, for the most part that we've seen in the past couple of decades. So this is kind of like looking back at a supernova exploding, but it has not yet, like the impact of it has not yet reached earth. Um, we, we are not really, um, you, you'd have to extrapolate to see, to think of what that, what's going to happen when the people who uh, started college in 2018 or 2021 finish college and then 20 years out from, from there in the absence of something changing. Um, so here's one more <laughs> difficult statistic to grapple with um, that is undermining um, maybe assumptions that higher education is going to equalize wealth. Um, if you remember the racial wealth gap overall has been roughly steady for the past couple decades at um, 10 cents of black wealth for every dollar of white wealth. Um, but if you only compare white and black borrowers, this is from 2019 data, that wealth disparity is double. So for black uh, student loan borrowers, they have only five cents of the wealth of white student borrowers. So again, we are comparing very different groups of people so they're going, they're both going to have like different futures, but also their present tense is different in terms of how much wealth they have at their disposal. Um, this is not a situation that time will naturally improve. Um, like I said, these are compounding inequalities and they're going to continue to compound apart from each other. And while those um, stats are fresh in your head, I want to kind of bring your attention for a minute. I'm just going to briefly address some of the uh, one of the main existing solutions that people have been proposing um, for student debt that is not cancellation, um, which revolves usually around some form of income derived repayment. Um, and that that is, you know, one there, there are multiple iterations, but basically they peg a student's uh, loan repayment, like monthly payment to their income. Um, and we can address this at greater length if you wish later, um, if you bring it up, but in the, I just wanted to bring it up right here in the context of these long-term debt trajectories I have just been illustrating to show that a solution that involves extending your debt obligation for longer is not actually solving any type of problem of wealth inequality. It is solving the problem of students' ability to repay perhaps their default risk, but it is not addressing the, the disparate impact on um, households. It is not going to help people build wealth. Um, it is not going to make education a better bet for people um, than otherwise. It will increase students' balances for longer. It does not address the problem of how we fund higher education, especially public higher education. And I will can also talk about this later, but so far the early evidence, the whole point of the way this works is that you're supposed to make kind of a minimum payment for 20 to 25 years. And then at the end, you will get the remainder of your debt forgiven. But the early indicators are so far, especially with the public service loan forgiveness program that people are not actually getting their debt forgiven. So instead they're getting asked to sign, like agree to have their debt balance go up for between 10 and 25 years without paying it down successfully and then hope and pray that the government will forgive their debt. Um, and so far it is, that is not manifesting. So I wanna um, move on from the individual level 
um, to the institutional level to, to think about this problem in kind of a broader perspective. And here there's a pretty clear pattern, which is um, seeing states cutting their funding uh, for public higher education. And um, this is a trend that came before the Great Recession, but really um, accelerated during and after the Great Recession. So even after states had recovered, um, they did not restore their funding to previous levels. Um, this uh, slide is showing uh, every state in red with bars to the left of your screen still has lower funding relative to pre-recession levels as of 2018. So very few states have increased their funding relative um, to before the recession. I know it's real small. Um, uh, I looked at Florida. So it's like, it's, so Florida is 13 and a half percent lower than it used to be. Iowa is 28% uh, lower <laughs> than pre-recession. So they're down by close to a third. Um, and then you can compare that you know, you have this neat vase shape where, interestingly, tuition has increased um, uh, in a comparable scope as state funding has decreased at public universities. So here, Florida is high up. It, Florida's has gone up by up almost 60%. Um, and so it's not like one-to-one -one that each state has like increased tuition by the amount that they've cut state funding. But you can see overall that the trend is, is that money was not coming from one source anymore. And so it is coming from a different pot, which is people um, instead. And, it, and, and just one more statistic, I think after this, I'm mostly done. Um, but I think it's partly, we have usually this debate without having the, like, the numbers in front of us. And so I made this a very number focused presentation. Um, but I, I just wanted to uh, note that like as, as far as a long, slightly longer trend before the recession. So the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities found that since 1988, student tuition went from funding a quarter of public universities um, to funding half of public universities costs. So this is a, a significant shift in um, the, the weight which we are, um, uh, affording to student-based revenues in public schools um, as compared to especially state funding, but also some things like federal, federal funding. So let's sum up some of these different trends and try to make sense of them together, because I do think that there is a coherent story that you can tell that makes sense of all of this. Um, so first we have education that's supposed to be the means of social equality with both white women and uh, people of color now being granted access to formerly exclusive universities after decades of activism and advocacy to, to gain entrance. Um, at the same time, we have seen a major shift in how public higher education is financed. It used to be primarily financed at the level of the institution by state and federal governments, and now um, it is increasingly financed um, at the level of the individual through student loans. And then this is in the context of a larger shift in the burden of social provision onto individuals, um, which is something I've written about a bunch. Um, and you can see it in state tax revolts, uh, school voucher movements, privatization efforts. And overall, you can see this growing opposition to the idea of the public good itself as something that benefits all. Um, and this shift occurred right at the same time that some people say we finally became a democracy in the 1960s when everyone was finally guaranteed the rights of access into public institutions. And at the same time, this was when this started tipping into, ah, these aren't things we want to fund anymore. Who wants those? Sure, you can, you know, welcome into these public schools. We'll just move um, the resources elsewhere. And lastly, these trends have served to displace and to some degree mask the effects of growing economic inequality and the long-term crisis in unemployment. We have a perennially convenient individual level explanation as long as we have student loans for why people can't get jobs. You just should go to college or you did it wrong and you should have gotten a different major or you need to go get a different degree. And then once you do that, you shouldn't have gone and gotten so much useless education because the the market has shifted in the 15 years that you were getting educated and now that um, you know industry doesn't exist anymore. And, and this is um, something that Tracy Millen Cottom calls, says that we are um, placing a lot 
on higher education that it can't um, actually be responsible for. And then basically we're attributing to higher education what is really the fault of a shitty labor market. And so far I've been showing who is disproportionately suffering from this phenomenon. I just wanna talk about who benefits from this situation. And that's another reason why I'm interested in studying debt is that it's relational inherently. There's somebody who is indebted and then there's somebody who is benefiting from that debt. And it's often not just the person who gets paid every month, but different kind of uh, more hyena type actors who are kind of perched to the side and, and finding ways to get a cut. Um, so we know that this is what, what Tracy Millen Cottom's book, Lower Ed, was about um, and, and was definitely influential in forming the idea of predatory inclusion because she was writing about the growth of for-profit colleges over this exact same time period that Black student debt was skyrocketing. So these were institutions um, increasing exponentially over that decade that we first saw this growth in Black student debt. Um, and they were explicitly targeting students of color, um, older students, parents. Um, they were targeting um, people who needed to be enrolled in school to qualify for social welfare benefits. They were targeting veterans because they had more favorable um, federal student loan conditions attached to them. And they would peg their tuition right to the amount that you could take out in federal student loan money. So it was a very efficient machine for capturing federal student loan dollars and turning them into private profit. Um, and for me, the most important takeaway of Professor Cottom's work was to show how for-profits are not qualitatively different than other forms of higher education. So we can feel very comfortable being like, oh, that's so evil, why would they do that? But what um, uh, Professor McMillan Cottom has said in um, talks and in her book is that what we are going to see is other institutions that are not nominally for profit adapting these innovative practices in terms of seeing students as increasingly kind of the avenue for them to 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 earn tuition to earn revenue um and sure enough uh you know i i kept that under my hat and started watching what was happening at the institutions i was working at and i saw that sure enough that that I started hearing a lot more language about we need to, you know, this department needs to be generating revenue, or we need to be targeting uh, recruiting underrepresented students better to compensate for the fact that our state has decreasing numbers of young people in it. We need to be going more out of state to make this a destination institution so that we can get higher out of state tuition um, out of students. Um, and, and I have been primed to think about this as well from my work um, studying Benton Harbor and where I was observing that even like school tax revenues were becoming captured in this case where a developer was um, using that to repay itself for a golf course development through a tax increment financing agreement. And it was, you know, clear when you see that happening <laughs> that a school district that is um, in, in danger of being shut down is uh, still having tax money siphoned off of it to repay a golf course developer that, that, that there's something going on in terms of the conversion of public revenues into private profit. And we have this increased porousness in institutions where we might be looking for something that looks like privatization or private profit or like it became all the way privatized, but where I'm having to become more comfortable is not in between area that's really uncomfortable where um, you can see things like how universities have taken on a whole lot of debt to um, do things like pay off their to, to have new capital projects, but then they're promising students tuition to pay repay that debt. Um, so uh, Bob Meister wrote a very interesting article about this in the case of the UC system back in 20, 2009. And he was pointing out like, look, this tuition is being promised now to repay all of the bonds. So they, they're saying that if they wanted to, they could take all student tuition and devote it towards um, debt payments rather than things like instruction uh, <laughs> that we might have traditionally associated with the university. 
um, I'll just mention that the the debt collective has been doing a lot of work about student cancel debt cancellation, and they are um, one of their campaigns is to start getting us to look at this institutional debt more closely. And they are planning. They're still early stages of planning, but a debt reveal day where people at different universities can look up how much debt each university has and what percent of their overall budget that makes up. Um, and I can post that link if anybody wants it later on when you don't have to like try and write it down. <laughs> um, but this brings me to like the last thing I wanted to talk about really, which is student debt cancellation, um, which is something I have been involved in the most out of all of these things. Um, and there's my page. Um, I helped uh, conduct some of the research that went into Senator Warren's debt cancellation plan in April 2019. And, and we found that canceling up to $50,000 per person would lead to significant impacts. And um, we were looking at the, some specific criteria. So we were prioritizing looking at racial equity in, term, in, in evaluating this policy. Um, and so we were looking at um, different metrics to see how many people would get full cancellation, how many people would go from negative to positive wealth, and then both absolute and relative wealth gains by race. And, and we were just developing these as different measures to, to see how you could like look at a policy, ch potential policy change that is being conducted in the name of increasing racial equity without accidentally reproducing racial inequity in a different way. Because the reason why this matters is that while the median black borrower holds a lot more debt, white borrowers are overly are higher represented at the top end of the spectrum. And so um, uh, forgiving all student debt would disproportionately benefit um, white people. That's basically what this graph shows. For more, you can look at the multiple working papers that we've been producing on this topic. Um, but the you know the punchline is that with the most recent um, data, around three quarters of Black households would have their student debt entirely wiped out with a cancellation of this size. But the as student debt goes up this quickly, like we don't have that much longer for until until that's not no longer true. Um, so it's a really urgent situation. But here's one thing that I think I have two statistics of what type of impact that might look at that look like um, in the language that we've been using up till now. So if I was showing you that really depressing statistic that black borrowers have five cents on the dollar for white borrowers, this is what universal debt cancellation up to fifty thousand dollars would look like. So suddenly, this one change, black borrowers would have thirty cents, thirty three cents to a white borrower's dollar. So this is a really large shift in the wealth disparities um and and like i'll emphasize this is a universal policy this is not if we only forgave debt for black borrowers this is forgiving everybody's debt up to fifty thousand dollars and i think that's both exciting to show how much one policy could change the situation for people but it also shows how bad the situation is right now if if this one policy would make such a huge difference here's one more thing that could be of interest $50,000 in cancellation would increase black wealth by one third for all households. So that's in measuring absolute dollars. But again, this is a very large um, difference in terms like not only a third of black households hold student debt. So erasing $50,000 in student debt would would increase black wealth as a whole as I think roughly like $8,000 per capita in wealth increase. Um, so this like would be pretty obviously transformative and it, and it's why um, advocates are framing this in terms of a, a racial equity um, lens. And then people say, well, what would we do after that? Because the debt would just start ticking upwards again. And then I'm like, that is a great problem to have. And that is why people have been at the same time proposing things that would make um, public college free or extremely low cost, because I agree, we shouldn't just start counting upwards again from, it shouldn't be a one-time jubilee, but this is an opportunity to really rethink how we are funding, especially public higher education, and to acknowledge that the way we've been doing it um, is a failed experiment, and that this just combination of factors has made it unfeasible to continue this way. I think that no matter what, 
it should be clear that we cannot just say we have a choice to either do this or not, or maybe just modify income drive repayment. Like we have to do something really big to solve this problem. Um, and I think that's it. Yes, thank you.